Hi everyone, welcome back to another video and we are starting a series called Step-by-Step -Step Embryology. We're going to cover all the way from fertilization through the end of gestation and it's going to be a lot of content since embryology is a very heavy in-depth subject and we're going to go system by system, uh, week by week, talking about how an embryo forms. Um, it's going to be really exciting. Since I'm going to be gone for a few weeks anyway, I figured we'd start off with fertilization, the most probably uh, appropriate place to start off a series on embryology. And a lot of this is going to be review probably for many of you, but that's fine because I'm going to add some extra content to make this a bit more interesting. Uh, so of course we have our diagram here. Uh, we have an ovary, we have the fimbriae, we have the fallopian tube, which consists of the infundibulum, the ampulla, the isthmus, and then you have the uterus kind of over here on the side uh, because we're not really going to need that part today. We're barely going to need this image because I'm going to go to some other pictures as well. Uh, but as you notice, we have an ovary. The ovary is going to um, make a follicle, a follicle which is going to be um, mature at this point. The mature follicle is going to be ovulated into the fallopian tube. Um, it's going to be picked up by the fimbriae, but funny thing here is that the fimbriae don't actually connect directly to the ovary. So you have the, the ovum kind of out in the peritoneum for a little bit before it gets picked up, and you can actually have this ovum get lost somewhere in the abdominal cavity, and that would be an abdominal ectopic pregnancy. So if if it uh, fertilizes out here and, and implants somewhere in the abdomen, that's where you get that. You can actually have an ectopic pregnancy um, happen in the liver. We've seen cases of the ovum traveling all the way to the liver and implanting there. Uh, so it's funny that the fimbriae don't directly just pick up the ovum. There is a, a time when it's just kind of freely out there. Uh, but we're going to say that this mature follicle is ovulated into the proper place. It goes through the fimbriae into the fallopian tube. And then, of course, we know what comes next. We have the sperm that come up through the fallopian tube, and they are going to interact with this ovum. And that's where I'm going to move over to the other diagram. Uh, take a bit more of a look at this. So we have our ovum and we have multiple layers to this ovum. And first off, the sperm, you're going to have probably hundreds of these sperm uh, all trying to get there. Um, they're going to go up through uh, the uterus into the fallopian tube, going to end up making contact with the ovum. So we have this this first sperm is going to uh, make contact with the gelatinous layer, which is the outermost layer of the ovum. And then once it makes contact, um, it has these enzymes in the acrosome, or this uh, end part of the sperm. It's going to release the acrosomal enzymes to dissolve the gelatinous layer. And then once it does this, it's going to move forward and bind with a receptor protein. So there's a protein on the acrosome of the sperm that's going to bind with the receptor protein on the vitellin layer of the ovum. And then once that happens, they're going to fuse. So the sperm is going to fuse with the plasma membrane in the vitellin layer. It's going to um, kind of eject the nucleus of the sperm into the cytosol. And then from there, you are going to get um, DNA replication, and you're going to have um, the next phases of cleavage happening as we move from a, a one-celled uh, zygote into multiple cells. And we're not going to get into that. That's going to be covered in the next video. But I do want to cover something interesting here about where this process can go wrong, because of course... It seems miraculous that we have the sperm that can bind to the ovum, that can go through all of these steps and supply a nucleus of paternal DNA to this ovum. But that's not always what happens, and it can get very messy. So we're going to cover something called a hydatidiform molar pregnancy, also called a molar pregnancy. And... The first word is just kind of really fun to say, so I included it. But this is what happens when DNA goes wrong, or at least one of the results of what happens when DNA goes wrong 
in the fertilization stage of the pregnancy. So if we follow meiosis, uh, we have one cell here. Let's take one cell as an example. We have two N chromosomes. So we have one chromosome here from um, the mom, one chromosome here from dad, and then that's going to replicate. So we're going to have two copies of each chromosome. So we go from 2N to 4N, and then that cell is going to divide, giving us two cells, two daughter cells that are both 2N. So we go from 2N, so one from mom, one from dad, to two from mom, two from dad, and then back down to one and one. So this is pretty simple, right? And there are some things that can go wrong here as well, but we're not focusing on that today. We're going to go on to the next step. So typically what is supposed to happen is you're supposed to pull one copy over to one side and the other copy over to the other side. You are going to split it down the middle and get N, so a single copy of chromosomes in one gamete and another singular set of chromosomes in the other gamete. So this should be your daughter cells at the end. These would be typical gametes. So um, let's talk about, before we get into atypical gametes, let's take a typical gamete and what happens, because as we saw before, we have this sperm that is going to drop off the nucleus uh, into the cytosol, but after that happens, the vitellin layer is actually going to become impermeable, and that is supposed to prevent um, fertilization by multiple sperm. But sometimes you have sperm that are, are fertilizing at the same time, and you don't give the vitellin layer a chance to become impermeable and separate from the plasma membrane. So in that very rare case, what happens when you have fertilization by two sperm? So we have a typical, normal um, ovum, but we're going to have two sperm. So here we go. We have 23 chromosomes in the ovum and then we have two sperm are going to attach at the same time they are both going to inject their nuclei and so we get 23 from mom and then 23 from the first sperm and 23 from the second sperm so we have 29 or sorry we have 69 chromosomes nice 69 chromosomes in this zygote and this is what we call a partial mole or a partial molar pregnancy. And something that's interesting about this is that it might actually contain a live fetus. Uh, so you get on ultrasound with a molar pregnancy, you're going to get what looks like a cluster of grapes. Like if you were to ultrasound, you just get uh, literally just looks like uh, little clear balls or some, some grapes is what it looks like uh, and some cloudiness around it. But in this case, it's interesting because we have 69 chromosomes, but we still might have a live fetus. And that's because we do have enough DNA to be viable. We have 23 from maternal DNA and 23 from paternal DNA. So you can actually get a live fetus. And there are case studies of this where you have somebody who had a partial mole that went undetected for even 31 weeks and they delivered uh, this fetus. And here's the problem, though. Because you have so much DNA, you have so much uh, lack of regulation here, that you can get increased cancer risk. And in fact, this type of pregnancy, a molar pregnancy, is technically a cancer pregnancy. Uh, so it can grow pretty unregulated and becomes a trophoblastic neoplasm. And we can cover more of that later uh, but essentially, the trophoblast can grow out of control, and you can get malignancy. So this is dangerous. Even if you have a live fetus, this could be detrimental to the health of the parent carrying it, and it might have a heartbeat. It might seem like it's a typical pregnancy, but this is very dangerous and needs to be caught very early. Um, so the next one, if we have uh, some abnormal... DNA in the ovum. So we have, once again, this process, we go from 2N to 4N to 2N. We're supposed to go to N. 
But let's say we mess up our division here. So instead of splitting half of the chromosomes to each side, we're going to pull both sets to one side and divide. So we have one cell, one gamete, that is 2N. You have two copies of DNA in this cell, and then this cell has no DNA. No maternal DNA ended up in this gamete. So what happens if we ovulate this gamete without DNA and it gets fertilized? Well, you get this. So you get no DNA, you get a sperm, and then from there, you start off with 23 paternal chromosomes, which then will multiply into 46. So technically, you have the normal amount of DNA. 46 chromosomes is typical for a human, but the problem is you only have paternal DNA and you are missing a lot of genes that you should be getting from the X chromosome and from the ovum. Um, and also mitochondrial DNA is going to probably be an issue here too. But the point is, you cannot make a viable pregnancy. You cannot have a live fetus with this type of complete molar pregnancy. So you get just the image on ultrasound of the, the grapes with the very cloudy um, outside. And this is just straight up cancer. This is very dangerous. Uh, and what you're going to see with something like this, and even with the partial mole, is that the uh, beta HCG that you use to detect pregnancy is going to skyrocket. So if you have beta HCG um, that is way higher, we're talking in the thousands higher than it should be, you can probably suspect a molar pregnancy. You need to remove it because this can kill people very quickly. Um, so... This is some interesting content for fertilization. Next video, we're going to talk about the first few days of pregnancy and talking about implantation and starting to see um, some differentiation of cells forming. So I hope you enjoyed this video and stay curious. I will see you all in the next one.